Over the years, horse owners have had many different theories about the cause of cribbing. This annoying and physically damaging compulsive behavior that is honestly quite distressing for humans to observe. For a long time, the cause of cribbing was a mystery, and people thought that it was just this annoying behavior that some horses just do. There has been a long-standing belief that horses can learn to crib from watching other horses crib, and some people have even said that it may be a result of a skeletal alignment issue. Though today, thanks to the wonders of science, we now know these theories to be untrue. We now know that the main causes of cribbing are compromised welfare and repetitive or prolonged stress. But recent research is suggesting another potential cause of cribbing for some horses, a cause that may be hiding in your horse's genetics. Hey guys, welcome or welcome back. About a month ago, I made a deep dive video into stereotypic behaviors in horses. I went over what they are, what causes them, how to manage them, how to improve their frequency, and whether or not we should be physically preventing them. This video is a bit of a part two, so I suggest that you go and watch that video first. I will put a card up here and I'll link it in the description. One thing that I did not include in that video is some more recent research that is suggesting a potential genetic component to cribbing development. I asked if you guys would be interested in a quick little part two to cover that topic and a lot of you said yes, so here we are. Before we start talking about genetics, let's just do a quick little refresher on cribbing. Cribbing, or crib biting, is a type of abnormal compulsive behavior called a stereotypic behavior or stereotypy that is observed in horses. Cribbing, as well as other stereotypic behaviors in horses, are not observed in feral or free-ranging horses, which helps lead equine scientists to the conclusion that these behaviors develop as a result of subpar human management of horses. Stereotypic behaviors are repetitive and mostly invariant behaviors that appear to have no goal or function. They are linked to a horse's welfare being compromised either currently or in the past, whether due to a lack of turnout time, time with herdmates, limited forage, or too much time stalled, stressful work conditions, or excessive boredom. Cribbing and other stereotypic behaviors are seen as behavioral coping mechanisms to handle stress. But cribbing also rewires the dopamine pathways in the brain, so once they've established cribbing as a behavior, they are unlikely to ever give it up, even with all of the right management changes and physical prevention tools. Cribbing can cause physical damage to the horse's teeth by wearing them down prematurely and as a result can cause a horse to lose weight because they are no longer able to chew their food properly. There is also some potential link between cribbing and increased colic risk, but whether or not that link is truly there, and if so, why the link exists is really not clear. All right, little recap done, let's talk about genetics, which is not, not my area of expertise, just for the record. Equine scientists and horse owners have long suspected that there is a potential genetic component to cribbing and other stereotypies in horses. And when I say long suspected, I mean like for hundreds of years people have suspected this. But since there is little to no information surrounding genetic factors with other stereotypies, we're only going to talk about cribbing today. But there is a potential link for some other stereotypies as well, or at least it is theorized that there is potentially a genetic link for other ones, but it just hasn't been studied quite yet, or at least I think I found one that was looking at stereotypies in general, but that is about it. These suspicions have been due to observations of horses over the past couple hundred years that have shown us that cribbing is more common in certain breeds of horses and even within certain bloodlines of those breeds. Thoroughbreds and warmbloods seem to be more likely to crib than any other breeds, with thoroughbreds being three times more likely to develop cribbing as a repetitive behavior than other breeds, and warmbloods being almost twice as likely as any other breed. Though it could be argued that the prevalence of cribbing in these breeds is not necessarily due to genetics, but the management that these breeds commonly receive. Since thoroughbreds are commonly used as racehorses or high-performance horses in other disciplines, and warmbloods are also a common, uh, a common choice for high-level show prospects, they are often subjected to more strict management that is not as species appropriate as some other breeds of horses. This is one of those situations where we have the whole correlation does not equal causation thing at work because just because we see cribbing more in thoroughbreds doesn't necessarily mean it's genetic. It could be genetic but there are also other factors that play into this. Though, because cribbing does seem to be more common within certain families of horses, with some studies showing that if a horse has a parent that is a cribber, they are more likely to be a cribber too, it does reinforce the potential of a genetic predisposition. Efforts to identify these specific genetic causal factors have yielded no results as of yet. There are many potential genes that could influence compulsive behaviors that haven't been investigated yet, like those that control certain dopamine and GABA receptors. So we don't know what gene is the culprit 
culprit yet, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Many equine scientists are convinced that there is a genetic component to cribbing, and some studies have confirmed that there are genetic factors that play a role in the onset of cribbing, but the cribbing gene specifically hasn't been identified yet. Some veterinarians and equine scientists now are actually recommending that if you have a horse that cribs, you don't breed them because there is the potential for them to pass on that behavior to their offspring. Regardless of a potential genetic predisposition, that doesn't mean that every horse that cribs has that gene, and even if a horse does have that gene, it doesn't necessarily mean that they will develop cribbing. A genetic predisposition means that you have an increased likelihood to develop something that's inherited, not that you have a 100% guarantee to develop it. So at the end of the day, while having knowledge about potential genetic predispositions can provide us insight into the behavior and help us determine which horses we should be keeping a closer eye on, it doesn't really change anything about what we should be doing with our horses. Whether or not a horse has a genetic predisposition to cribbing or another stereotypic behavior, we should always be trying to to provide them the best possible management and the best possible care, and we should always be trying to keep their stress levels as low as possible. To avoid a horse becoming a cribber, it's important to provide as much turnout as possible with as much social contact with other horses as possible, provide adequate quality and quantity of forage, provide enrichment and exercise, and keep the concentrate portion of their diet as low as possible. It's also important to try to keep their stress levels as low as possible during training and just keep their environment as low stress as possible. It is possible to keep your horse below threshold like 95% of the time. There are of course certain times when you can't, for example, if you have a horse who has severe behavioral issues, it's gonna take a while to get to the, a point where training does not cause larger amounts of stress. Been there, done that. It's hard, right? No one horse is the same, but we should always be striving to keep stress as low as possible. Does that mean we should be striving for it to never be there? I don't think so necessarily. I think you have to prepare your horse for scary things. Anyways, I digress. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I know that it was a bit of a shorter one, but there's not a ton of research or information about this topic that's available to the public yet. I'm sure that there are a few studies that are, you know, available to vet students and whatnot, but this is what I was able to find. Remember that you can follow both me and Padfoot over on Instagram if you would like to see more of our day-to-day -day lives and click subscribe and a like and maybe leave a comment if you like this video because that helps support me and helps boost the channel. I have actually also started a second channel. This is going to be my vlog channel. It's called Cats Creatures Vlogs. I will link it or tag it in the description in case you're interested. That is going to be where all of my vlogs are from now on. So any of my videos that are of me out at the barn, working with, training my horse, you know, barn vlogs, any vlogs with my dog, anything like that, those are all going to be over there now from, from here on out. Um, unfortunately, having those vlog style videos over here on this channel where most people come for the educational video essays, it affects performance because most people here are not here to watch the vlogs. And so when I post a video, and that doesn't do well because it's not what you guys are looking for, which is totally fine, by the way. You don't have to be interested in my, in my life. Um, it, it affects the overall channel's performance. So that is where vlogs are gonna be from now on in case you're interested in seeing those. It's mostly still gonna be animal-related vlogs. Um, you'll also see videos like I might share things about like how I do things, like um, planning to do like what my dog eats in a day or here's like what I feed my horse or like anything like that. If you're interested in how I take care of my animals, any videos like that will be over there from now on. So check it out if you're interested. All right, rambliness done, done. This will actually maybe not be a short video. Am I capable of making a video that's less than 15 minutes? I don't know. Thank you guys so much for watching. And until I see you in the next one, please remember to think critically.